<laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very warm welcome indeed to the 2023 SIME lecture. Um, if you don't know, I'm Tim Hitchens. I'm the president of the, of the college. Um, and these lectures, of course, are in honour of the distinguished Wolfson Fellow, Professor Ronald Syme, who was <coughs> elected here in 1970 and remained with us, uh, prolific as ever, until his death at the age of 86 in 1989. Tonight we're delighted to welcome another prolific expert in ancient Rome, Professor David Potter. Uh, Professor Potter completed his DPhil here at Oxford, uh, undertook a postdoc position at New College in the early 80s before becoming assistant professor in Latin at Bryn Mawr College in 84. In 1986, his relationship with the Classics Department of the University of Michigan began and continues to this day as Francis W. Kelsey Collegiate Professor of Greek and Roman History, and as Arthur F. Thurnau Professor, Professor of Greek and Latin. Professor Potter has a well-deserved reputation for taking on large themes across a wide range of ancient history. He's been immensely productive, with a large output of monographs, as well as influential edited works, such as the Blackwell Companion to the Roman Empire. He's written extensively on the Roman world from the 1st century BCE up to the 6th century CE, with a particular expertise on the later empire, 3rd to 6th century. And his main focus has been on the troubled political history of the 3rd century and the reign of Constantine in the early 4th, which brought about those changes in the Roman state which distinguishes the late empire from earlier periods. He's generally been interested in the influence of beliefs and individuals on political history. His earliest work, I think, was on the Sibylline Oracles and the political history of the Roman world in the third century. His most recent book, I think, uh, is Disruption, Why Things Change, 2021, and it explores the way radical change results from the collapse of the political centre. This is explored through a series of case studies, including the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity, the rise of Islam, the Protestant Reformation, the French and the American revolutions, and finally the rise of Bolshevism and Nazism. And an epilogue explores the challenges currently confronting liberal democracies. So Professor Potter, we look forward to hearing your sign lecture. Well, Tim, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, it is a very great pleasure to be here and also to thank um, three people who can't be here, my uh, wife and daughters, who have spent an awful lot of their lives listening to a man who thinks all too much about the Roman Empire. <laughs> I'm also very deeply uh, honored to be with you this evening um, to offer these thoughts in honor of a scholar whose generous comments on a paper sent to him by a first-year graduate student many years ago were profoundly encouraging, sent him in the direction of Sibylline oracles and things like that, and whose presence in the Ashmolean every morning was a reminder that, as he once wrote, there is work to be done, and that for all of his gifts, he was regularly doing it. He and his dear friend on the Greek side, Tony Andrews, provided support and encouragement, combining kindness with rigor, to show those of us in those days how to explore the past in a way that is meaningful to the present. And now what I'd like to do is to move on. There we go. Now, uh, to the months before Napoleon Bonaparte died in St. Helena in 1821. It was in those months that he dictated a commentary on the life and works of Julius Caesar. The section based on the Caesarian corpus, uh, Napoleon summarized um, each book, um, adding some comments of his own at the end of each summary. Uh, this commentary, and especially the summaries, offer a unique reading of one general by another. 
At times, it is possible to sense a spirit of professional rivalry, as when Napoleon states that Caesar's invasion of Britain and Germany in 55 achieved absolutely nothing. In other places, Napoleon explains how Caesar's preferred defensive tactics and use of field fortifications would not be successful in the era of gunpowder weapons. He is perpetually interested in the number of men deployed, never questioning what we would see as obvious falsehoods, um, such as Caesar's claim that he lost only 200 men at the Battle of Pharsalus. At the same time, Napoleon notes that wouldn't be possible nowadays, because nowadays the ratio of losses of victor to uh, defeated is one to three. Um, he's very interested in well, as well in the speed of movement, observing that what, what might have been seen in antiquity as very rapid movement, the eight days it took Caesar to get from Rome to Geneva, would be slow by modern standards. Napoleon could do it in four. No sense of competition whatsoever. Uh, however, um, it's when Napoleon turns to discuss the overall direction of Caesar's career that he is perhaps at his most uh, perceptive and interesting. Um, in denying that Caesar had any interest in making himself king, he wrote, as dictator for life, Caesar governed the entire Roman universe. The Senate was a mere shell. Things could not be otherwise. After the prescription of Marius and Sulla, the violation of the laws by Pompey, five years of civil war, with so great a number of veterans settled in Italy, attached to their generals, counting on receiving everything from the greatness of particular men, nothing from the Republic. In such a state of affairs, the deliberative assemblies were unable to govern. It was thus the person of Caesar that guaranteed the supremacy of Rome over the universe and assured the safety of the citizens, whatever their party, Therefore, his authority was legitimate. All this, though this might be read as Napoleon on himself, uh, his point that Caesar's political vision involved the direction of the republic's uh, failed institutions, I think is a profoundly correct reading of Caesar's own work. Napoleon is here opposing his own understanding of the man to that which appears in accounts of the latter, latter years of Caesar's life in Suetonius and Plutarch, and their theme that Caesar's interest in kingship justified his assassination. Of course, Napoleon isn't about to suggest that his interest in being an emperor justified his own assassination, but never mind. Um, what both Napoleon and Caesar understood, however, was that the dysfunction of democratic institutions enabled dictatorship. Now, the Gallic War, uh, is, on the one hand, of course, a work of quite explicit propaganda designed to explain and justify Caesar's career, demonstrate his possession of ideal military qualities, speed, courage, foresight, planning, endurance, and mercy. But as Napoleon realized, the book is more than an exercise in self-promotional propaganda. Implicit in the narrative, uh, are Caesar's views on how to run an army, the administrative characteristics that emerge in the course of the narrative are tactical innovation, deep concern for logistics, concern for accurate intelligence, accountability, and the unity of the military mission with the political. In what follows, I will offer an analysis of Caesar's vision of himself as a leader and of his understanding of Roman political society as presented in the Gallic War. I agree with Peter Wiseman that the text that we have uh, here is based on rewritten versions of accounts he sent to the Senate about his doings in Gaul uh, for delivery to public audiences of some sort uh, around Italy, uh, hence the use of the third person uh, in place of the first person, uh, which we may deduce from uh, Cicero uh, it was typical of reports that governors sent to the Senate. Um, where I would differ from uh, Wiseman's analysis, however, um, is in the exploitation or understanding of the first-person cross-references uh, within the Gallic War, uh, which do employ, uh, do assume the written form of a book. Um, the regular phrase is, um, as I said above. 
Um, and um, these cross-references, to my mind, indicate that books one to five, as we have them, were produced in the spring of 53. The longest cross-reference uh, in all of the work uh, is between book five on the character of the Gallic leader Domnorix, uh, just before Caesar has him murdered, uh, and his, the lengthy discussion of his disagreeable conduct, as Caesar would have it, uh, in book one. Book six and seven, I think, were completed after the campaigning season of 52. Uh, one reason I think that these books should be uh, seen as separate from one to five, um, although there is a back reference from six to five, uh, is that Caesar included an extensive e ethnography of Gauls and Germans in book six, a way of sort of setting things up again, uh, which I think was quite redundant in the wake of the German ethnography that was in book four, and of course, the famous introduction to the state of Gaul at the beginning of book one. Now, in the fourth Catalinarian, uh, Cicero said that Caesar uh, followed the path in the state which is held to be popularist, to be popular. After the Civil War, he observed that the outcome uh, would have been the same whether Caesar or Pompey had won, that the state would have been under the personal domination of one man. What Cicero saw as tyranny is identical with the path that Caesar identified as popularist throughout the Bellum Gallicum, uh, and also, as Quintus Caesar points out to himself, the path that C Cicero himself had supported for Pompey in the early 60s, which was being opposed to the style of aristocratic government. Um, the best interests of the people uh, were served, in the view of Caesar, I think, uh, by effective leadership, not by the institutions of aristocratic government. Caesar is nowhere uh, explicit as to what makes a good general or a good organization. He is a good storyteller, and on the surface, as many scholars have noted, the Gallic War is just that, a very good story about his brilliant general, his brave army, confronting hordes of barbarians who are slaughtered left, right, and center. It is from between the lines that Caesar's understanding of generalship and management, as well as the political program based on those principles, emerges. The Gaul Caesar enters, so he says, looks like a nightmare version um, of the Rome he left behind. As you can see, the ordinary people, uh, he says, uh, the, the whole state is divided. Uh, virtually every village and household into two factions. The leaders are the men who are thought to have the greatest authority. All affairs and plans come down to their choice and judgment. It appears to have been established a long time ago that no one from amongst the people should lack support amongst the leaders uh, who will not allow their clients to be oppressed or cheated. But you cannot be an average Gaul unless you are the client uh, of a member of the leadership. Uh, and uh, even more uh, seriously, uh, as we can see here, as Caesar says, the ordinary people are considered almost as slaves. They dare do nothing on their own account. They have no voice. When the majority are oppressed by debt or weight of taxation, or harmed by powerful men, they swear themselves into slavery to the notables, and they have the same power over them uh, as do masters over slaves. The conquest of Gaul depended upon Caesar's ability to organize the Gauls. And it is here that we begin to form a picture of Caesarian administrative practices. Two of the most prominent aspects of Caesar's campaign narratives are the stress on logistics and the constant enhancement of intelligence. Discussions of campaigns tend to open uh, with discussions of supply. His views of a general's responsibility to ensure that an army arrives on a battlefield in a fit state to fight, emerge most clearly from the speech he gives to the assembly of centurions at Vesantio when he had received word of a potential mutiny. Now, um, with that uh, delightful habit of Roman soldiers, whenever they thought the general was going to get them killed, to start reading out their wills in front of their tents. Um, a little hard to miss that one. 
Um, and that complaints circulated in the camp included wor worry that the supply line was insufficient and the march was too difficult. Now, to be fair to Caesar's legionaries, uh, they had also marched um, from uh, Ton uh, to Bessacon, the latter part of which uphill in August. I quite understand why they're a bit upset at that point. Um, but um, by the beginning of 54, he had plainly developed a network that would free him from dependence on individual tribes. When news came to Caesar of the destruction of the troops with Sabinus and Cotta and the siege of Quintus Cicero's camp, uh, he said he left Crassus in charge of Amiens, where he had placed all the hostages, his correspondence, the grain that had been gathered, gathered for the winter, and where he had previously held meetings of uh, the Gallic tribes, uh, really the center of government at that point. Uh, the use of the place as the headquarters for the staff who remained in Gaul for the winter is suggested also uh, by Cicero's letters to Trebatius in the first part of 53. Um, that is where you're going to be based if you're an aspiring lawyer working for Caesar. The progressive enhancement of the army's supply system with significantly greater Roman direction is evident at the beginning of the campaign of 52, which began with the destruction of the Roman supply base at Orléans, where Caesar says that there were Roman citizens who'd come uh, to the area to do business, and there was an equestrian official, uh, Fufius Quita, whom Caesar describes as the person in charge of the grain supply. Later, in his account of the revolt of the Edui in the same summer, Caesar indicates that there were Roman merchants settled amongst the tribes. The key point is that supply depends on organizing the Gauls to make them far more efficient. Um, again, one of the early scenes in 58 uh, is how Dumnorix disrupts the supply system for the army on campaign against the Helvetians. Amazing, he lived to 55. Uh, strategic intelligence um, also depends on local networks. At the beginning of the fourth book uh, of the Gallic War, Caesar makes it clear about where he thinks bad intelligence comes from. Uh, Gauls are fickle in planning and eager for novelty. For this reason, he did not think they should be trusted. In addition, uh, there is this Gallic habit, which is that they compel travelers, even when they are unwilling, to stop, and they seek to find out what each of them may have heard or knows about some matter. And a crowd stands around merchants and towns and compels each one to speak about the areas they've come from and the business they know about. Moved by what they have heard, they often make plans about the most important matters of which they have to repent very rapidly, since they are beholden to uncertain reports, and many people tell them false things according to their own interests. It is a general's responsibility um, to recognize self-interested informants when he encounters them. In dealing with the Edui in the campaign of 58, he makes it clear that his information about Dumnorix and what a terrible person he is comes from Liscus, the leader of the Edui that year. And who better to provide uh, political information about his own person than a person who, for whose honesty has been vouched for by somebody else that Caesar uh, trusts? Um, what you want to do is find people uh, towards the top who you can talk to. He also makes use of Valerius Trochilus, whom he describes as a leading man of the province. Caesar must have made this connection with him before the campaign began. Uh, rather quick work. Caesar says that Diviciacus, the one person he really trusted, showed him a route he could use for his advance against Ariovistus. Information about the Belgae comes from the, leading, the leaders of the Remi in 57. The Ubi, who appealed for his assistance in 53, likewise appeared to have provided local guidance uh, for the German campaign, something they would also do, um, sorry, in 55, um, and something they would also do in 53. Uh, Caesar's preference for using well-placed locals who knew the relevant languages uh, reappears in the preparation for the invasion of Britain in 55, when he sent Comius, whom, having defeated the Atrabati, he, took, he had made king there, 
whose courage and judgment he recognized, and whom he judged faithful to himself, and whose authority in these parts he deemed to be substantial. That's another bit that couldn't be rewritten later, because Comius turned out to be one of the leaders of the revolt in 52. Oh well, don't always get it right. Uh, the further statement that he sent uh, Gaius Volusianus to scout landing places, and that British tribes sent ambassadors who promised hostages, look as if he might also be making a case that he had done due diligence before committing himself to the first landing. At other points, Caesar names individuals with specific knowledge on his staff. Before advancing against Ariovistus, he had gathered information from Gallic leaders, but he had also recruited at least one person who knew Ariovistus personally. This is Marcus Medius. He was joined on the peace mission to Ariovistus by Valerius Proculus, the son of a respected provincial, Valerius Caburus, who had been given the citizenship just a few years before by Valerius uh, Flaccus. Caesar explains he was a good choice because of his loyalty uh, and, again, knowledge of the relevant languages. Caesar's comments about Proculus point to the fact he was able to use some existing networks for recruitment, um, and that may have enabled him to build the connection, for instance, with Valerius Troculus, in addition to Valerius Flaccus, there was, of course, Gnaeus Pompey, who had also commanded in the area, the father of the historian Pompeius Trogus, uh, whose own father had received the franchise from Pompey, joined Caesar's staff about as soon as Caesar reached the province. Another Gnaeus Pompey who shows up, uh, perhaps in slightly less favorable circumstance, uh, is serving with Sabinus uh, in the winter of 54. Uh, and he is Sabinus' personal translator uh, when uh, trying to deal with Ambiorix. Um, and it may be, in fact, that Sabinus even knew him a little bit earlier because Sabinus had served with Pompey. Uh, but again, you know, drawing upon existing networks is part of what we see uh, going on. Um, among the many fav uh, failings of Tertullius Sabinus uh, before the disaster in 54 was that he took the word of Ambiorix at face value without checking to see if what he told him was true. Addition, um, okay. uh, in addition to operating with adequate resources and intelligence, Caesar set high standards of accountability for himself and his subordinates. Failures needed to be investigated and studied, and if, um, even if all the details of an investigation uh, don't make it into the text, um, Napoleon wrote, for instance, of Caesar's conduct at the Battle of the Sambre, that Caesar has, been rightly, has rightly been criticized for allowing himself to be taken by surprise at the Battle of the Sambre, given the number of cavalry and light troops available to him. It is true that his cavalry and light troops crossed the Sambre, but from where he stood, he could have seen that they stopped 300 yards from the edge of the forest, so he should have kept some troops under arms or waited for his scouts to traverse the forest and establish the state of the country. These points are not admitted in the Gallic War. But it is clear that Caesar launched an investigation of what went wrong uh, when he mentions how the Nervi came to understand his marching order. Uh, again, um, uh, as he tells us, uh, as was afterwards learned from captives, how did you know what we were doing? Uh, he wanted to know that, wanted to find that out. Um, likewise, in his discussion of how uh, Publius Considius mistook Labienus' men for Helvetians in Book I, uh, he suggests that there was an investigation into what went wrong, and Caesar appears to be justifying his choice of a man of dubious competence for an important task when he says, he'd, after all, he'd previously served under Sulla and Crassus, he's supposed to know what he's doing. Uh, pity he doesn't. He doesn't show up again in the Gallic War. There are also signs of an investigation into the reasons for the defeat at Dragovia. Um, uh, as Caesar says, that the men could not have heard the trumpets that sounded the recall, but he notes they still disobeyed the orders of their officers who had, as he had ordered, tried to prevent their advance. He then said that he told his men that their defeat stemmed from their failure to obey the signal and their officers. There's something of a disconnect between uh, what Caesar says he knew about the signal and what he says to his men is, uh, is likely a sign of the way he thought uh, he should convey information 
as to how a commander, uh, convey his view of how a commander should behave. Uh, in discussing the near catastrophe suffered uh, by Quintus Cicero at Aduatuca in 53, he observes that Cicero, who had followed his orders, um, had done well up until the point in which he had surrendered to the complaints of his men and allowed them to leave the camp. He'd previously praised Cicero, in stark contrast to Sabinus, for following orders in the winter of 54 to 53. Uh, but here again, uh, we'll return to the question of the relationship between officers and men and who learns what from whom and who has responsibility in a few minutes. The most serious defeat Caesar suffered between the destruction of the force led by Sabinus and Cotta, um, sorry, the most serious destruction Caesar suffered had been the destruction of the force led by Sabinus and Cotta at Aduatuca the previous year. Um, the generally favorable references to Sabinus in earlier books of the Gallic War may reflect not only his capacity, but also Caesar's need to justify placing an officer who showed himself to be so lacking in a position of command. Caesar's principal complaint is that in the face of clear instructions from himself, Sabinus should uh, have left his camp without further in instructions from the general. Caesar had done so overruling his less experienced colleague, in doing so, he contradicts his own statement to the troops that you can see here uh, from Book 3 of the Gallic War in 56, that a legate ought not to take risky actions in the absence of the supreme commander. Explanations of defeat are self-serving, but the constant theme uh, on these occasions is revelatory of Caesar's practice of command. The explanation for defeat is that people disobeyed orders. Caesar did not expect initiative from his subordinates, uh, Caesar summed up his view to the, on the limits of initiative allowed a subordinate in his praise for the conduct of Publius Sulla at Dyrrachium in 48, the second item on the slide here. Um, many people thought that, he had pursued, uh, that if he had pursued them more vigorously, it would have been possible to end the war that day. His actions should not be criticized. The roles of legates and of the supreme commander are different. The one does everything as ordered, the other ought to be concerned with the most important matters. Throughout the, Bell the Gallic War, the point comes across repeatedly that the quality of the army is shaped from the top down, that soldiers learn from the courage of their officers. And of course, uh, here in one of the most uh, remarkable and famous passages of the Battle with the Nervi, uh, Caesar depicts himself literally as showing his men how to fight. Uh, and again, the ordering of the sentences is very, very interesting in this case. Taking his shield from a soldier in the rear rank since he had come without a shield, he went down to the front rank, calling on the centurions by name and encouraging the rest of the men to advance their standards, to loosen their ranks so they could use their um, swords more easily. Um, in the African War, the theme is picked up again by the author, who at one point describes Sister Caesar as acting like a gladiatorial trainer in showing his men how to fight. Uh, soldiers cannot function uh, without a properly functioning office corps, officer corps. Soldiers are supposed to do what their officers tell them. They learn from their officers uh, very clearly. Uh, this army is not intended to be anything like a democracy. Uh, the administration of discipline uh, is often very public. We can get a sense of this from the author of the African War again, uh, who no draws attention to the way that Caesar handled uh, some tribunes of the 10th Legion who'd been involved in the mutiny prior to the opening of the North African campaign in 46. They had incited their troops to mutiny, so Caesar says, I should have wished above all that people might, might at long last to put an end to their impertinence and insubordination and cease to take advantage of my leniency, moderation, and forbearance. This in front of the entire army then fires them. Um, I think in this case, the, the author of the African War is catching up uh, with quite a few situations earlier on. Caesar's repeated reference to the written instructions he sent to his legates appear to confirm reports in Suetonius and the Elder Pliny of the flow of communication outwards from Caesar's headquarters and the implication that initiative was not a quality Caesar valued in his subordinates. 
The lesson seems to have been deeply ingrained by the time of the Civil War, not just from the behavior of Publius Sulla, uh, but when Caesar was in Alexandria and, Africa and Asia Minor, Antony and others uh, showed very little initiative in dealing uh, with veteran mutinies and other problems. They were waiting until the boss could tell them what exactly they were supposed to do. In his handling of Gallic politics, Caesar models what he expects um, to see, I think, in Rome. The campaign against Ariovistus is presented as a campaign on behalf of the Edui, and Eduan interests are plainly being served by the campaign against the Belgae. As the campaign progressed, Caesar appears to have worked to build regional institutions that could function effectively with his army. The first sign that Caesar was attempting to create central governing structures uh, for Gaul appear in the campaign uh, of 54, where we suddenly find a whole series of interventions. Um, here he summons the leaders of all the states of Gaul, he tells us now, to join him before the invasion of Britain. The meeting may have been based on earlier regional meetings that Caesar mentioned in 58 and 57, uh, but now they are centered on the Roman uh, camp. The purpose of the general meetings, which Caesar says took place in the spring, appears to have been to organize joint military action between Caesar and Gallic allies to identify acceptable leadership. At the beginning of the Gallic ethnography in Book 6, again, Caesar writes that he had restored the position of the Edui uh, through his defeat of Ariovistus and that those who allied themselves into friendship with the Edui saw that they enjoyed better terms and conditions of government, while in other respects their influence and prestige increased. Crises arrive when Gallic leaders do not understand, that their, own, do not understand their own interests and lead the common people astray. Exhibit 1 is, again, Dumnorix, whom Caesar said had become extremely powerful so that he could bid for control of Eduan revenues. Nobody dared bid against him, which enabled him to obtain the contract uh, for customs duties at a very low cost. And as a result, he could maintain a private army of his own. Prior, prior to his arrival in Caesar's camp in 54, Dumnorix had allegedly told the Edui that Caesar intended to make him king. The claim certainly reflects a policy Caesar was beginning to adopt of replacing annually elected magistrates with leaders who, uh, he, could, who could, he could convince tribal councils to accept, leaders uh, who could be held more readily accountable. Dumnorix presumably made his claim to cause trouble. Uh, but Caesar had already made, as we've seen, call me as king of the Atrabati. He had established a man named Tazgit as king of the Carnutes. Caesar himself appears to joke about the enhanced policy uh, when he wrote to Cicero saying that he would make a younger friend of his a king in Gaul uh, in the spring of 54. It is hard to resist the notion uh, that interference in local government uh, became more marked that year and that this could be connected to the outbreak of the revolt um, that soon followed. In Book 7, he says that he promoted the uh, the career of a man, young man named Vera Domaris to the highest dignity in the state. Although born outside the highest aristocracy, he had been recommended by Divikiakis. Again, you can replace inefficient aristocrats uh, with more efficient uh, people of less exalted background. At the meeting prior to the invasion of in, uh, Britain, um, uh, Caesar uh, is intervening in the affairs of the Treveri to in, in, impose Singatorix in place of Indu Tiomaris, whom he distrusted as leader. In this case, Caesar tried to build a broader consensus for Singatorix at a meeting, as he tells us, of the leaders of the Treveri, whom he had reconciled to Singatorix's leadership individually so that his authority amongst them would be that much stronger. Caesar says that Singatorix had earned his position through outstanding goodwill towards himself. Caesar goes on to point out that Singatorix's rival, Indutia Maris, had not come to the meeting. Don't miss department meetings. Um, claiming that if left without a leader, the common people would get into trouble when the nobility was away. 
in the end, Indutiamara showed up, was infuriated that Caesar had convinced the nobility to support his rival. He'd be killed at the end of the year, trying to raise the treverie uh, to join the revolt of Ambiorix. In the spring of 53, Caesar said that he summoned a meeting of all the Gauls, as he was accustomed, one of those throwaway lines uh, that you get just once. When the Senones, Carnutes, and Treveri did not show up, Caesar, who again, in one of those throwaway lines, he uses two words only that give you a picture of it, speaking from the magistrate's platform, uh, told them uh, that uh, he wanted the, to, to move the meeting. Uh, he was going to move down to um, the land of the Parisi, who are neighbors of the Senones. The approach of the legions leads the Senones to surrender. And in doing so, they use their friends, the Edui, as intermediaries. When the Carnutes used the Remi then to plead their, uh, their cause, he then ends the council and advances against the Treveri with cavalry from the estates. And at the end of the summer, Caesar holds another meeting of all the Gauls to investigate the, reading, uh, the reasons for the conspiracy um, of the Carnutes and the Senones. At this point, he orders the execution of Acco, who had been identified as a leader of the earlier anti-Roman movement. Caesar seems to have had some doubts, though, about uh, his own chosen chieftain of the Senones, who he said had a hot temper. The desertion of the Edgewe to Vercingetorix in 52 uh, is attributed to failed elective leadership. In this case, Caesar says that two men, convict do Litavis and Cotus were disputing the chief magistracy of the tribe, and the Senate was too weak to resolve the dispute. Caesar placed convict Theo Latavis in office, only to have Cotus take a large bribe from the Arvini and plot to join Vercingetorix with a group of young aristocrats led by a man named uh, Litavicus. The overall picture paints, Caesar paints, is of a failing state. The leadership that he had tried to develop is overwhelmed by dishonest rivals uh, who appeal to the common people. Hirtius accurately summed up Caesar's view of the political order in his eighth book of the Gallic War when he wrote that Caesar told the Belavaki that no one was strong enough to incite war with a lowly band of people if the leading people were unwilling. The Senate resisted and all the wealthy were opposed. As Caesar says of two Gallic nobles in the Civil War, he had given them lands in Gaul, captured from the enemy, and large monetary rewards, and turned them from poor men into rich men. The same, of course, was true for Romans, whom Caesar trusted most. All people from outside the uh, central ranks of the aristocracy, um, his great lieutenants, Labienus, Mamura, also, of course, uh, the subject of some of Catullus's most vitriolic verse. Balbus, and Cicero complains in a letter to Atticus just before the outbreak of the Civil War, how do we deal with all of this? Um, it appalls him. These are all new men and their visible success stemmed from their connection with Caesar. And that was obvious to the Roman people, um, as of course was the construction of, or the beginning of the construction of Caesar's own forum uh, at vast cost next to the Roman forum. Financial inequity does not seem to have been a problem on the Via Popularis at this point. For Caesar, there is no question but the political leadership will be provided by aristocrats. The issue is whether that leadership will have the best interest of the people at heart. For a Gaul, the best interest was loyalty to Rome. Loyalty built the power to intercede and thus gain greater advantage. Uh, for local populations. Roman society is also not without its challenges in the Gallic War. Caesar suggests that his political rivals are in contact with Ariovistus in 58 uh, and states that the chaos surrounding the murder of Publius Clodius encouraged the revolt in 52. Uh, at the beginning of the book, he points to his collaboration uh, with Pompey to remedy the disaster at Aduatuca. At the beginning of Book 7, he praises Pompey's actions as sole consul to bring order to the state, enabling Caesar to deal with the situation in Gaul. He is very clear that he commands the army of the Roman people and that he is conscious of acting to enhance the dignity of the Roman people. 
What he nowhere suggests is that the standard institutions of the Roman state are viable. His picture of the common people of Gaul as victims of self-interested aristocrat, self aristocrats can e who can easily deceive them raises questions about how he might have viewed the common people of Rome. His praise of Pompey is praise of a person like himself who owes his authority to laws the Roman people had passed creating extraordinary commands outside of the ordinary political apparatus. What Caesar advertises, advertises by implication is a government for the Roman people which will ensure their welfare by effective management. The model that he offers of good management is highly centralized and autocratic. For Caesar in the 60s, the Via Popularis had meant the protection of the Roman people from arbitrary actions by Roman magistrates, above all through the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, allowing for Roman citizens to be executed without trial. He'd sought to undo the effects of the Sullen prescriptions to extend the franchise to Transalpine Gaul, and to, sorry, to Cisalpine, Gaul, Trans Cisalpine Gaul, and had supported laws granting commands to Pompey against the pirates and then against Mithridates. As consul, he supported Pompey's settlement in the east and, suggest, and a passage of a grain bill managed by a special commission before obtaining an extraordinary command for himself. For Caesar, the protection of the Roman people depended upon efficient leadership. By implication, that was not the leadership provided through the annual electoral process. In books six and seven, he draws attention to his alliance with Gnaeus Pompey. It is this which allows him to recover rapidly from the disaster at Duotuca and respond to the revolt in 52. Caesar and Pompey stood at the head of vast organizations that provided financial and administrative services across the empire. The Via Popularis was a path to better government through, the efficient, through efficient corporate management. The program that emerges from the pages of the Gallic War is the transformation of the Roman state so that it can be governed by the holders of long-term commands who are not at the whim of faction. They can better achieve and guarantee the welfare of the Roman people. However, when Gnaeus Pompey is detached from his friendship uh, by members of the traditional aristocracy, there is no excuse but to, or no other reason, or no other thing that Caesar can do but cross the Rubicon. Thank you for this exploration of self-serving discourse. So I think we're going to have the opportunity to take some questions from the audience if there are any questions. Um, and we do have a number of people who are following this online, so if you're able to ask your questions using the microphone which um, we have up there, that would be very helpful. So who would like to start the ball rolling with any questions or thoughts on what we've just heard? Yep, gentleman over here. So in, in one of the early passages that you uh, quoted from Caesar, he describes a system that a cynic might see as the clientela of Rome, but sort of translated into Gaul. Uh, how do you see that playing out in Caesar's idea of sort of managing Romans? Well, I think you know, what is very striking uh, throughout, uh, throughout is the similarity between the way he describes a dysfunctional Gallic society as run by self-interested aristocrats and things that start going wrong in Rome. I mean, I think this starts out really my favorite uh, line in book one, um, where Ariovistus gets this wonderful set piece. He begins by quoting the Melian Dialogue, which I think gives you an idea of roughly the kinds of people Caesar was writing for, and then goes on to say, and of course I know that there are a lot of people in Rome who want me to kill you. Uh, so again, the implication is that uh, Caesar's aristocratic rivals are betraying the army of the Roman people. Um, and then when you do get down um, you know, to the beginning of 52, I mean, the, the, on the one hand, there's a patent absurdity of the notion that the Gauls are all watching the murder of Clodius and say, oh, look at that, let's have a revolt. Um, but again, it's in a way that absurdity that points to the um, way that he models one society against uh, or the two societies together. 
Uh, and then his, his line, again, uh, uh, of Pompey's consulship in 52, is wind through the great, his great virtue, Gnaeus Pompey had brought order to the state. Uh, get to book one of the Civil War, and Caesar points to the uh, consulship of Pompey, sole consulship of Pompey, as an sort of assault on the uh, constitution of the Romans. You know, and he'll have it every way he possibly can. Um, but also the way that he sort of paints a picture of successful Gallic um, uh, politicians, again, as people who work, from, work into the system and through the system, and the way that their, uh, you know, their the sort of extended clientela system uh, that he's building through Gallic leadership, I think it's very, it's very striking and looks very much like he's transferred a model of Roman society. Um. Uh, any other questions or thoughts from anyone? Lady up here. Um, so, oh, that's very quite loud. Um, it does, so, you, what you're saying is that the like, do you see the, the projection of the clientele system and all the other things that seem very Roman in his description of Gaul as a propaganda tool or a tool to make the story, like, land home with somebody who was hearing it and be like, oh, yeah, they just have a very similar system to us? Or do you think it actually represented a real system that actually existed? Oh, that's a very good question. And uh, the answer is, I think he is drawing a picture of a society so it uh, sounds completely familiar. Um, there are a number of cases where he completely re re misrepresents the structure uh, of Celtic society in Gaul. Now, it is clear, it does seem, really, that if you look at the Opida and the smaller uh, settlements, uh, that obviously Gaul is an aristocratic society. There is a, and, I mean, one of the early slides uh, does show gold coinage. Uh, it's a far more sophisticated society economically than he lets on. Uh, but after all, has to be able to pay for his army after a while. Um, uh, perhaps the nastiest bit of it uh, is his suggestion that the Belgae are a bunch of barbarians because the Romans never get there. That coin hoard, as I showed, is from Tungeren, uh, which is actually the hometown of Ambiorix. Uh, and I think at the end of um, one of the things that he's trying to justify is essentially ethnic cleansing in northern Belgium um, at the end of 54 and the beginning of 53. Uh, which he partially does by saying that this is how you scare the Germans away. Um, so, uh, but by and large, he does not allow, I mean, he at one hand allows us to see Gauls who are sophisticated enough to deal very easily with Romans, while then implying that this is a society that uh, is less sophisticated than, than it really is. Any other thoughts or questions from the audience? No, I think, well, I, I would say that um, after this event, as is normal with the Syme Lecture, we do have a reception, so people are more than welcome to join us at that reception uh, and indeed continue the conversation with, with Professor Potter as part of that. But I think it probably now falls to me to, on behalf of the audience, uh, both here and at home, to thank you for that extraordinarily clear and learned description of what it is that Caesar was describing, how that fitted with his own views of the situation back in Rome, um, and the link to Napoleon was a fantastic way of starting the thing. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, and as I say, people are very welcome to follow us through to the buttery, where we now have drinks um, for everyone who's been part of this event. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much. For